Mexico, 1100 years ago. A religious ceremony unfolds. Maya guards throw their captive into a bottomless sinkhole, never to be seen again. Until now, we're on a mission to follow his descent deep into the watery blackness to learn what this ritual sacrifice can tell us about a pending apocalypse, the Maya Doomsday Prophecy. On December 21st, 2012. Are we all doomed? Is life on Earth gonna end on December 21st, 2012? Is this what the Maya really predicted? Everyone here is part of a National Geographic expedition. To see if these sacrifices can shed new light on our own pending apocalypse, our experts will discover something so shocking, it will change everything we know about the Maya end of days. I'm Diego Buñuel. I've covered more than 10 wars, explored radioactive wastelands, and climbed high in the Himalayas. <laughs> But this journey has a special resonance. I've got two kids. To be quite honest, the question that I would like answered is, will we make it past Christmas? My adventure starts here, at what looks like a normal well in the jungles of Mexico. If I drop, I drop straight down but it secretly opens into the sheer cliffs of the Cenote Holtun. So this is a cenote, right? This is a cenote. So it's basically what, underwater caverns? They are underwater caverns, and we believe the ancient Maya caught it. That, so this is thousands modern. of years old, this, this opening? Probably, probably thousands, probably thousands of years old. We're in the eastern Yucatan, less than 112 kilometers from the capital, Merida, where the rivers run underground creating a vast aquifer. The Maya got their water from these cenotes, which were created when the limestone surface collapsed, exposing pools that descend down nearly 100 meters. It's a very holy place. It's the entrance to the underworld. But the Maya also used the cenotes to offer jewelry and beautiful ceramics to a fearsome water god, Chalk. And in times of drought, the Maya upped the ante and threw in human sacrifices. In a desperate attempt to persuade Chalk to provide rain. Well, I can tell you one thing. I just hope the gods are appeased here because <laughs> I don't want to be a vain sacrifice. Well, this is like the Underworld Express here. Let's go down to the Underworld. Whoa. It's a 21 meter drop to the water surface. Easy. Well, when we look at these roots, they go all the way down into the well. Hey, this is some Indiana Jones stuff right here, yeah. right? <laughs> there are bats all over. It's like the Batman cavern here. Guillermo de Anda is the perfect guide to the underworld and the secrets it can tell us about the Maya end of days. The Mayas believe that a magical tree was the axis of the universe and the roots of the tree would be going down to the cenotes, basically. Exactly. So we are right now on, on the roots of the universe. This is the boundary between the physical world and the supernatural world. Wow. So it's a place with a lot of meaning. It's amazing. It seems like this beautiful cavern is in the middle of nowhere. But it used to be part of a bustling city. Chichen Itza. 
1,200 years ago, it was a vital hub in a Maya network of quarreling, trading, and warring city-states that covered southern Mexico and the northern half of Central America. Like the rest of the Maya society, Chichen Itza had monumental architecture, writing, and a sophisticated culture that rivaled anything in the world at the time. They even had their equivalent of NFL football, but with a very dark twist. So this is Chichen Itza's main ball court. I mean, it's huge. Let me give you the 101 on how this game was played. You couldn't really use your hands or your feet. So what did you use exactly? Well, you had to use your hips, the side of your hips. Now, that wasn't complicated enough. You had to send the ball through this hoop on top of the wall to get all kinds of special points. Now, you have to imagine thousands of Maya spectators on top of these ramparts looking down upon the ball players playing as if their lives depended on it. Well, actually, uh, their lives did depend on it. Now this is the Wall of Skulls. It's a pretty ominous name, but for good reason, because every one of the skulls you see here represents the severed head of a defeated player during important matches. Now, let me tell you one thing. During halftime, well, the coach didn't really have to do any pep talks because everyone knew why they had to win. Chichen Itza was a place of startling violence, both in sport and religion. The Maya used human sacrifice to impress not only their gods, but the people themselves, performing the rituals high on a platform for everyone to see. So archaeologists believe that this is one of the places where they made sacrifices, human sacrifices. The victim would be put down like this. You know, I fit snugly here in between, and then they would the priest would carve out a hole like this under the ribs, would pull up, thrust his hand inside, and rip out the heart. And if it was done properly, well, the heart would still be beating. Human blood was the food of the gods. But Chak, the water god who lives in the cenotes, had a different agenda. He wanted the sacrifices brought to him sometimes alive. The most important cenote was in the middle of Chichen Itza, Cenote Sagrado, the sacred cenote. But no one is allowed in. So this was the end of the road for the people that were going to be sacrificed. Look at this place. You have to understand that this is the holy of holies for the Mayas. If you were to be pushed in there, well, you'd be joining hundreds, maybe thousands of people have been sacrificed. What this cenote really is, is a mass grave. Sometimes the human sacrifice was a noble, or even a king from a rival city. Some believe they were forced to drink hallucinogens or liquor, and paraded through villages, stripped of any dignity. There was no mercy. What do these cenotes tell us about the Maya culture? They tell us the story of maybe times where were not so good for the Maya. In fact, times were terrible for the Maya. In the 9th and 10th centuries, Maya society disintegrated. The entire civilization abandoned their magnificent pyramids, their carefully landscaped plazas, their comfortable palaces. It was the first Maya doomsday. But how does this chaos relate to the pending Maya end of days in December 2012? Surprisingly enough, the answer may lie underwater. We're heading to the bottom of the Cenote Holtun, where artifacts and human remains are locked in perpetual darkness. 
clip it on here where this rope is. And we're using a revolutionary tool specially developed by National Geographic. One that will literally light up the abyss like never before. The Sun Sphere. It's been battle tested during a Bob Ballard expedition to explore the ocean floor. Over five kilometers straight down. You want to see it? Yeah, definitely. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a modern oh, disco ball. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this disco ball is going to light up a cenote like never before. It's time for Dionda and his team to do some very dangerous diving. You know, there are old cave divers. Uh, and there are bold cave divers, mm. but there are no, no old, bold cave divers, mm -hmm. and that's because they end up dying. Unfortunately, approaching tropical storms are adding to the risk. We alternate between sunshine and torrential rain. As you see, rain started again, so uh, I don't really believe in bad luck, but at one point, you have to do something about it. Anyway, we have, a, we have a shaman with us today that we called in specially to try to see if we can, uh, you know, dispel the bad juju that we've had with the rain so far. Look, the sun is out, so whatever he did seemed to have worked. So now he's going to make sure that everyone's going to be safe, so he's going to bless every single one of the divers as they, they start going down. See you, Bucky. See you from the other side. Yeah. And now, $50,000 worth of technology into the drink. It's amazing. It looks like some UFO they're lowering down into the cave there. OK, good luck and be safe. Thank you. If you see uh, Chuck downstairs, just say hello. Huh? Dionda and his team are trying to reach the bottom, more than 35 meters below. But it's too dangerous to dive for an amateur like me. After 24 meters, the nitrogen in your blood begins to build up and can make divers act drunk, causing you to lose your ability to swim or even disconnect your own air supply. It's called nitrogen narcosis. It's essential the divers check on each other to make sure that no one shows signs of this deadly condition. Check if we have video. OK, and now the sound. OK, welcome, everyone, to the show. Guillermo, do you copy? Guillermo, Guillermo, do you copy? Guillermo, do you copy? Uh, Guillermo, are you OK? Guillermo? Guillermo, do you copy? Archaeologist Guillermo de Anda has vanished down a 45-meter underwater cave. Guillermo, Guillermo, do you copy? OK, Guillermo, yeah, I copy now. Can you copy me? Yeah, loud and clear. OK, great. Becky, I just saw your fins. Uh, can you nod the camera to confirm? Yep. OK, great. Is it, it looking pretty, OK? Pretty bad. In terms of visibility? Terrible. We can't even see the sun sphere. Like one problem never comes without another. Now it started raining again. I can see the sun sphere now. Yeah, I barely saw it through the sediment. I mean, this is amazing. This is our sun sphere. An enormous ball of light underwater. The rain keeps a deluge of mud and organic material from the jungle. And it, I mean, it takes hours, if not days or weeks, for all those particles to settle on the bottom 
Diego, we see that it's so bad. We don't see anything. Do you think it's uh, it's dangerous to have that many people in the water with a uh, little visibility? I think it is, definitely. OK, so we're aborting the, the mission? We go up, yes. OK, mission abort. When did this rain start? It started about uh, 40 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. Oh. When you're coming up, all you see is like chocolate milk swirling in the water from this like waterfall, waterfall of, mud. of mud that's coming yeah. down there. Yeah. It's as if an angry Chuck, the Maya water god, has struck back. So we can't try again until the water clears. We have to wait. But maybe this is a blessing in disguise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I have a chance to head to Chichen Itza and find out more about the Maya prediction that the world will end on December 21st, 2012. And it all begins with their calendar. Oh, 91 steps. Ooh. Wow. John, thanks for meeting me here. Yeah, sure. What? Why so many steps? Why 91? Why not 40 or something? I mean, it's such an odd number. Well, it's not such an odd number when you consider there are four sides to the pyramid. Uh -huh. 91 times 4 gives you 364. Uh -huh. Add the large structure on top, you get 365. Does that number mean anything yeah, to you? Yeah, every day of the year, I guess. Well, they knew what they were doing, these Maya. The building represents a, an annual calendar. The Maya calendar was based on careful observation of the heavens and advanced mathematics. It was kept by an elite class of scribes, often drawn from royal families. There were some of the few Maya who could read and write. So what's the deal with this Maya calendar here? I mean, were they obsessed with time? Well, I don't think they were any more obsessed with time than we are. You've got your watch, I've got <laughs> mine. We also have clocks on our cell phones. They were very interested in knowing how time influenced the way that they made decisions, planning for agriculture. It's very similar to opening the newspaper and looking at your horoscope. Is it a five-star day or a two-star day? Are you going to have good luck or bad luck? The Maya see time unfolding in different cycles. They can be 20 days or 64 million years long. One of the primary cycles, the Bakhtun, is 144,000 days long. For the Maya, the first people emerged from the underworld 5,126 years ago, the beginning of human time. Now the 13th Bakhtuns dating from this creation are coming to an end on December 21st, 2012. 13 was a very powerful number for the Maya. So many are convinced December 21st will bring an apocalypse. This precise date is carved on a monumental stone at the ancient Maya city, Tortuguero, near the Gulf of Mexico. If this doomsday prophecy was so important to the Maya, well, you'd think they'd talk about it more. There's only been one reference to it. And well, that's until now. We found a second one. In La Corona, Guatemala, deep and hot humid jungle, Archaeologists make a remarkable discovery, a new set of hieroglyphs. Only a few people in the world can read them. One is David Stewart, the scholar who helped crack the Maya code at age 19. What he finds is mind-boggling. He talks about the end of the 13th Bakhtun oh my goodness. in 2012. Absolutely true. Further investigation points directly to a date we know well, December 21st, 2012. So is there going to be an apocalypse? Are we all going to die? And what were the Maya thinking? Well, to find out, we have to take a road trip to a secret location.
We are tracking the Maya Doomsday prediction for December 21st, 2012. But where did this dire forecast originate? The answer is most likely hidden in the writing of Maya scribes. And I've got my hands on a copy of their work. So valuable that the location of this private library must remain a secret. So this is a really exciting moment for me. I'm here with uh, John Hoops. And what's really interesting is that we're looking at an exact copy of one of the only four books that survived of the entire Maya civilization. There were hundreds. Unfortunately, uh -huh. they were destroyed. Maya books were deeply revered. They were the record of Maya civilization. But most met a terrible fate. Burnt by the invading Spanish in the 16th century. Only four escaped destruction. The best preserved, called the Dresden Codex, is in a climate-controlled display case in Germany and almost impossible to access. But we found a rare, almost perfect copy, hand-colored by an Italian artist in the early 19th century. And it makes a startling revelation on the very last page. About 100 years ago, a German scholar identified this as a representation of a worldwide cataclysm or a flood. But that scholar, Ernst Wilhelm Forstemann, never imagined the uproar he'd cause. So, so what do we see exactly on it? Well, there's a lot of water on here. That's what this blue stuff is with all mm -hmm. of the dots on it. Mm -hmm. And the water is spilling out of a giant crocodile-like creature that's up in the sky. Forstemann saw a massive amount of water drowning the earth while two ominous-looking gods watch and a symbol of death, crossbones. It was a catastrophe. An apocalypse. This is what has triggered the whole doomsday frenzy that we're, we're living right now. That's where the problem is, and that some interpret it as a world-destroying cataclysm or a flood, and others don't see that. The water is coming down from above, which for me indicates a big thunderstorm. But not the end of days. Well, it may very well be the beginning of days, because these two deities here are mm -hmm. associated with creation and associated with the beginning. So basically, it's all a question of interpretation. I mean, the Dresden Codex could be celebrating life-giving rain, or it could be announcing a terrible flood, a doomsday, for December 21st, 2012. Well, some people are betting heavily on doomsday. Go! This is the Alamo. Last stand. The large cities are going to be death zones. The Maya inspired martial masters to prepare for an apocalypse. Now. If the rifle doesn't get them, this is where you use your 12-gauge shotgun. Even though Masters lives in Northern California, almost 5,000 kilometers from my ancestral lands, he believes in the prophecy. To me, December 21, 2012 is very significant. Masters' plan for what he sees as a chaotic future starts with a carefully selected arsenal of guns. There are two kinds of people in the world right now. There are those who are preparing, those who are not. Got to protect my family. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> when it comes to survival, there are just two strategies. You survive in place, or you survive on the move. I plan for both. At the center of his camp is his food and ammunition stash. When the dollars you have in your wallet are worth nothing more than toilet paper or kindling. What's the new currency of the world going to be after we pick ourselves up? Canned peaches. You can trade these for other things. For masters, global warming, financial crises, solar storms, lack of resources and overpopulation all interconnect to a Maya vision of a cataclysmic future. More than anything, I'm just a man on a mission, I think I'm a part of something larger. Humanity really is at a junction point. And no matter how bad it gets, there will be those of us that survive. Masters is ready for a global collapse that mirrors what happened to the Maya more than a thousand years ago. 
And we've been trying to find out more about this modern apocalypse by diving to the bottom of the deep and dangerous Cenote Holtun. But it hasn't been easy. Let me give you an update on the score here. Chalk 1, Nagio 0. We got rained out by the Maya water god Chalk and left with no visibility. For the past month, Guillermo de Anda has been checking to see if we can dive again. What does it look like down there? It, it still looks very, very bad. Uh -huh. it, uh, basically, it's terrible. It still looks like chocolate milk. I don't know if we're going up or down. Oh, really? It's that bad. But there is another option, less than 112 kilometers away. We haven't said our last word yet. We can dive in this incredible cenote called Cenote San Antonio, and it's a place that's very rich archaeologically. So let's hope that everything goes well, and especially let's pray that Chalk doesn't have any more tricks up his sleeve. I'm here in the middle of scrub jungle, miles away from anything. But this place actually used to be an ancient Maya settlement. Less than 112 kilometers from Cenote Holtun, another cenote called San Antonio was surrounded by major Maya cities. When the Spanish showed up here, they destroyed everything, but they reused a lot of these stones to build this wall, which surrounds what they thought was just a simple well. But in fact, this place, for the Mayas, was a sacred cenote. San Antonio is reputed to have been the site of multiple human sacrifices. But can these sacrifices tell us more about the Maya collapse? And how that influenced their prediction of an apocalypse in December 2012? There's only one way to find out. This is the moment we've been waiting for. A second chance to see what's at the bottom of a sacrificial well. Becky and Guillermo de Anda are back, but this time there's a newcomer to the dive team. Me. The easy part is getting in. It's my favorite part. God, look at this ray of light, I swear. Looks like a laser beam from the heavens. <laughs> but a laser beam isn't enough to do the job. <laughs> this is a preliminary dive. We're going down more than seven meters to check the visibility. Welcome, my friend. <laughs> oh, this is incredible. And Deanda promises there will be lots to see. Visibility is fantastic. The light we're getting from the sun sphere is just amazing. And it certainly looks alien enough, I can tell you that much. We already start seeing lots of bones. Here, it's a back bone. Shh. That bone might have been there for a thousand, maybe two thousand or more years. We don't know. But in this graveyard, I'm not separated from the dead by two meters of earth. They're right next to me. You know, it's really complicated here is that you have to be careful where you're actually putting your fins because I pick up your fin and you could be, you know, modifying history. Yes, we have to be very careful here, Diego. Yeah. Dianda sees Cenote San Antonio as a graveyard. The dead are respected. Nothing will be touched. Wow, look at those. So here we have two skulls that we can see. Again, I can tell it's a funerary chamber. Wow. Yeah, I can see rib cages here. I can see legs, arms. Wow. This is the femur. Right there. So do you think that this is the same 
Yeah. yeah. Individual with most parts. Exactly. It's a vertebrae there, so it's a complete individual here. The reality hits me. I am looking at people. Lots of people. If you want to try to understand what this whole doomsday is about, well, this is one part of the explanation to try to understand why they sacrificed people and why those sacrifices were important. Okay, you're getting, getting low. Wow. You go up now? Yes. Okay. We're going from the underworld back to the real world. Yeah. What a trip. We've just seen a shelf near the surface. But most of the sacrifices would have fallen to the bottom, at least 36 meters down, and maybe more. This is the real payoff, and that's where we're headed. Wow. What do you think? Yes, yeah, you know, an experience for sure. Yeah. But first, I need to understand what I've just seen. How could a civilization so refined subject people to such a terrible fate. My research is related to what motivated uh, the sacrifice, what motivated the offerings. It was uh, in times of trouble. There would have been more people sacrificed in times of crisis, basically. I think so, yes. And one big crisis was a drought. Mm -hmm. New climate research reveals there were devastating droughts throughout the Maya world in the 10th century the same time as their collapse. They were expecting their, their rulers, their priests, to be effective in communicating yeah. to the gods, and that just didn't happen. There must have been much more yeah. ritual activities. Got it. It's time to head to the bottom to investigate the real effects of this Maya collapse. It takes special training for a dive this deep, so I'm staying topside. Uh, Guillermo, do you copy? Excellent, I copy you well. Great, so this is it, we're going. Our sun sphere is a vital but dangerous part of the team. Even in the water, it runs hot, 60 degrees Celsius at its core. So it's always at risk of exploding. So we're going down. We're finally getting to the bottom of a sacred cenote. They have to go down to 100 or maybe even 120 feet. And what we find should be a treasure trove of archaeological data. Wow. I can see much more bones all around. You know, before when I dove here without the sun sphere, I didn't realize how much bones are here. And they are going all the way down. You can see bones strewn with bones everywhere. Now. Is that, is that the cranium? Is that someone's head? Yes, that's a cranium. And the whole body is there. These are the only remains of the people sacrificed to the Maya gods. Mothers and fathers, daughters and sons. <laughs> It's a great, great skull. It's very well preserved. The sun sphere helps us look at these people closely, scientifically, just like police detectives. When you're down here, you are doing a forensic analysis. Only the crime scene is very old. But in this case, the victims are sacred and can't be touched. Oh, wow. 
I can see a skull there. This is a skull of a very young person, probably 10 or 12 years old. The skull had uh, cut marks, so that's evidence that there was some ritual violence. That is really incredible. It is. It's just fantastic. These remains appear to be mostly young boys and girls. Who could have believed that the Maya sacrificed their young and innocent to the water god Chalk? Here there is children's skull, which is another boy or, or a male, maybe a little girl. Yeah, this is pretty impressive. This is not older than eight. Not older than eight years old. As the father of two young children, I find this very disturbing. They said that young children were the preferred victims for the gods, especially for Chuck, the rain god. Oh, here's a human jaw. Exactly. A piece of bone from the arm of a kid. There's another beautiful skull. It's another child. But this is amazing because there's bones everywhere. So basically, you're diving in a massive graveyard down there. Exactly. It feels, it feels like a very strong place. Inspire you a lot of respect. I mean, this is truly, like, amazing to travel back in time this way. While I may find it disturbing, one discovery in particular excites the scientist in Deanda. It's, it's, it's really, really amazing that we could you see that there was a very small um, skull. It was, it's, it's definitely a child, and and the the cut marks are very very clear, like in this area of the head, and uh, probably it's proof of scalping. Scalping a child shows that the Maya were pushed to the limit as their society began to collapse from deadly droughts. But even at the best of times, the Maya inflicted terrible punishment on their captives and themselves. I wanted to show this to you men out there. Uh, this is a stingray spine. And bloodletting was a big part of the Maya culture. Now, if you see the stinger, you'll see that there are barbs that go backwards this way. And basically, if you wanted to please the gods, well, you have to stick this in the male genitalia. Obviously, it could not come back out, so you had to push it all the way through. The gods were most pleased with blood from genitalia, dripped on paper, then burned so they could inhale the smoke. But during the terrible droughts, we can now see bloodletting wasn't enough. So the Maya increased the number of human sacrifices. Including their own children. But what about this doomsday prediction for December 21st, 2012? Is it gonna happen? Well, we may have an answer for that. And it comes from groundbreaking new research deep in the jungles of Guatemala. Where a few markings on an ancient wall may change everything we think about the doomsday prophecy for December 21st, 2012. In the dense jungles of Guatemala, angry howler monkeys guard the ruins of an ancient Maya city. Xoltun. It has been looted time and time again over the centuries, 
but Shultun may still hold clues to help us unravel the true meaning of the Maya doomsday prophecy. Cave diving isn't the only way to make new discoveries. Sometimes you have to do things the good old-fashioned way. And that's what archaeologist Bill Saturno is doing as he braves the crumbling looters' tunnels to make some remarkable discoveries. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's a large jade bead went around his neck of someone very important. The work is dangerous. Are you all right? Yeah. You okay? I just turned around and I just barely bumped my head on the top, but a whole thing of rocks came down, falling on my back of my head and on my camera. But the rewards are worth the risk. Saturno's team has made a find that sheds new light on the controversy about December 21st, 2012. Now, when looters burst through the corner of this room, they expose the first part of this mural that wraps around the walls. The very center was the king. Our king is surrounded by a series of figures, mysterious figures all in black, wearing only a loincloth, black headdress, and a single white medallion around their chest. Saturno is convinced that he has found the workroom of scribes, who are the keepers of the Maya calendar. The same calendar that may see a doomsday at the end of the 13th back to December 21st, 2012. In addition to the initial painting of this room, it was used over years and painted over and over again. And parts of it are simply sketches or studies of the human face. Another thing that they fill in is text all over the east wall. Numbers, calculations, tables that they're using as a reference. Little dates. These little dates scribbled on the wall may be vital to our quest. The most important one is probably right here. The naked eye sees just a blank wall. But advanced photographic techniques reveal dates. Dates that span as much as 7,000 years, well beyond the supposed Maya doomsday. What Saturno has found shows that the Maya time does not end on December 21st, 2012. I mean, one cares about dates after an apocalypse. The Maya cycles of time just extend on to an infinite future where past and future merge, and we live, die, and live again, repeating the cycles over and over. We don't have cycles that end. That's the point of a cycle, is that it continues. And that's how the Maya conceived of time. Saturno sees the calendar not like a countdown to disaster, but like the odometer on a car. We were certain that if we reached 100,000 miles, as that last digit clicked over and the whole thing went back to zero, we didn't think our car would vanish. So I'm relieved to find out that the world is going to go on as usual, at least past Christmas. However, my journey through the cenote has taught me something. Even if the Maya did not predict the exact moment of an apocalypse, what happened to them could happen to us. And in a world that is globally integrated, well, that means all of us. Oh yeah, let me tell you something else. Uh, if you're worried as I am about the end of the world, if you have this nagging feeling that something's just not quite right, well, we're not alone. We still have a lot to learn from the Maya.